Good morning, and welcome to our opening keynote session of the Achieving Research Equity and Inclusion Conference. It is so good to be with you here today. My name is Dr. Sherry Blauett. I'm an Associate Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School, as well as the Interim Chief Medical Officer of Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. It's my honor and privilege to introduce someone who I consider a friend and a colleague, Dr. Anjali Forber-Pratt. In 2021, Dr. Forber-Pratt was appointed by President Biden to serve as the director of the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, a branch of the Administration for Community Living under the Department of Health and Human Services. In this role, she oversees an annual budget of $116 million dedicated to funding rehabilitation research, training, and technical assistance, including the spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and burn model systems, all which support individuals with disabilities of all ages. As Spalding has historically been the only rehabilitation hospital in the country funded for all three of these model systems, we have had the great privilege to interact regularly with Dr. Forber Pratt and to collaborate in advancing the science of rehabilitation. Dr. Forber Pratt began her research career in 2006. Her primary area of expertise is disability identity development. Prior to joining ACL, she was a faculty member at Vanderbilt University, where she served as principal investigator for research projects covering a range of disability issues, including training on special education teachers, experiences of students with disabilities at every education level, and identity development. Another interesting aspect of Dr. Forber Pratt's background is the fact that she is a two-time Paralympian and medalist in the sport of wheelchair racing. In fact, she and I first had the opportunity to get to know one another when we served as teammates representing the United States at the Beijing 2008 Paralympic Games. In her post-competitive career, Dr. Forber Pratt has dedicated her life to helping others recognize their potential. In 2020, she was honored with the inaugural American Psychological Association Citizen Psychologist Award for advancing disability and human rights, excuse me, disability as a human rights and social justice issue. In 2013, she was awarded the American Association of People with Disabilities prestigious Paul G. Hearn Leadership Award given to emerging leaders within the national disability community. Also in 2013, she was named a champion of change by the White House and had an opportunity to participate in a roundtable discussion with President Obama about disability policy issues. Thank you, Dr. Forber Pratt, for joining us. And it goes without saying that we are incredibly excited to have the opportunity to learn from your personal and professional perspectives. And now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Blowat. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is, as you heard, my name is Dr. Anjali Forber Pratt and I'm the director of the National Institute of Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research within the Administration for Community Living. Today, I'm wearing a blue shirt with a black, uh, a black jacket over top, and I'm a brown-skinned woman with black hair. NIDLR is the federal government's primary disability research organization. Our main purpose is to fund grants that will generate new knowledge and to promote its effective use to improve the abilities of individuals with disabilities to perform activities of their choice in the community and to expand society's capacity to provide full opportunities and accommodations for its citizens with disabilities. One of my favorite quotes is from Gandhi, be the change you wish to see in the world. I think about this quote often in my role as I'm working hard to transform the research enterprise to be more inclusive of people with disabilities throughout all its processes. This is no easy task, but for far too long, the world of research has been dominated by predominantly white, cisgender and non-disabled male voices and researchers. That is not me. My identities that I wear proudly include a Paralympic medalist, Indian adoptee, disabled woman of color, a researcher and an activist. Prior to this role, I was on faculty at Vanderbilt University where I primarily studied disability identity development. From my experience, representation matters. I use a manual wheelchair and was adopted from India when I was two months old. And two months after arriving in the United States, I got sick with transverse myelitis when I was four and a half months old and became paralyzed from the waist down. About six years later, President George H.W. Bush made history when he signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law on July 26, 1990. As a six-year-old, I do not remember this as a momentous occasion, but what I do remember is this. 
as a young child, I thought everybody in the whole world had a disability and that this was just a phase I was one day going to outgrow. I also thought that in order to grow up and go to college, have a job, start a family, live on my own, I first had to learn how to walk. Why? Well, nearly every adult I knew could walk. Therefore, in my mind, in order to have access to these opportunities, I held this assumption that I first had to somehow make my disability disappear. I felt invisible and this lack of representation around me is what led to this assumption. I remember the day crying in the bushes at preschool when I realized this disability thing was here to stay. I realized in that low moment that I could let society's expectations or really lack of expectations for myself dictate my life, but I knew that wasn't gonna get me anywhere. Fortunately, I grew up just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, where as a young girl, I saw wheelchair racers from the Boston Marathon go flying by. And I learned through the power of example that people with disabilities could thrive, work, succeed athletically and in life. I latched on to the role models from that moment on. In fact, I dressed up as the winner of the Boston Marathon for Halloween, and I asserted in the sixth grade that I was going to go to the University of Illinois, become a Paralympian. It's strange to me, and also pretty cool, how many of those goals that I set for myself throughout childhood came true. Though, as I entered the academy and university, I once again found the lack of, ex of representation to be dismal. Something that is one of my priority areas as the director of Nidler is to work on improving this, to be that change and to bring what is needed in terms of more inclusion and equity into the research world. But it's important to talk about this from two different perspectives, diverse researchers as researchers, as the generators of the science, and diverse individuals as study participants. We need both and we are stronger with both. Our science is better with both. And it is way easier to design with intentionality, as you'll hear in the next panel, by embracing principles of universal design. Put simply, universal design is creating with intentionality so that the thing, the product or environment, can be accessed and understood and used to the greatest extent possible by as many people as possible, no matter their needs, abilities, backgrounds, education level, et cetera. If we apply these principles to our research design from the get-go, it serves as a catalyst into getting diverse representation and diverse, uh, diverse representative samples of participants in our studies. Yet, I'm also struck by how hard it is to find statistics about disabled researchers. The National Center for College Students with Disabilities estimates that 4% of all faculty members have a disability. Yet, the University of California at Berkeley they conducted a study and it was indicated that of their full-time faculty members, only 1.5% are disabled. I predict that this number would drastically be reduced if you look at those, the number of us um, who might be tenure track or tenured faculty. These numbers are discouraging given that 25.7% 20, of American adults, roughly 61.4 million are disabled. So I call on all of us to ask, how can we do better? One way has been Nidler's longtime commitment to training the next generation of researchers. We have two specific mechanisms for this, a Switzer fellowship program and an advanced rehabilitation research and training program to help to increase capacity for high quality rehabilitation research by supporting grants to institutions to provide advanced research training to individuals with doctorates or similar degrees and, or who have relevant experience. As a researcher, I reflected on my own encounters with ableism throughout my life that likely point to why the numbers are so low of disabled researchers and points to the need for mechanisms such as fellowships. In high school, I was told, what are you doing in an honors level English class? It's not like you can go to college anyway, by a teacher. When I was trying to register for an applied technology class or astronomy class, I was told by administrators, why do you want to take that? You're not actually interested in science, are you? Society's lack of expectations on people with disabilities have led to these discrepancies and these abysmal numbers. Therefore, this is one of the changes that I have taken up in my role to try to address where we can, and I encourage you all to do the same. I also want to note that I have a very visible disability. I cannot hide it, except a bit on Zoom here, where I've had to learn that I have to verbally disclose it. 
But there are many individuals who have less apparent or hidden disabilities who also grapple with that layer of disclosure every single day. I also recall going through graduate school and fiercely trying to separate research from my lived experience of disability. I thought they had to be separate because that's what was taught and reinforced. I was so fortunate to eventually find mentors who challenged me to bring the two together, which I did for my dissertation work. I told my story in the form of a screenplay as I explored disability identity development, representation, and building community. From these conversations with mentors, I gained confidence to be the creator and to tell my story my way. A key part in this process was finding my own voice and merging the academic and the personal. And I've never looked back since. Quite honestly, I found myself able to thrive in that gap because my own lived experience and lived experiences of others made my research better and stronger. And it was every researcher's dream to be able to directly engage with the community and share findings and what they really mean for the community. So I'm here to say it's a beautiful place to be in that in-between and among both worlds. And I personally welcome you all into this space too. For far too long, we have been taught and reinforced to separate the two. And even if you're not a qualitative researcher, you bring your whole self and your identities and your lens to the work that you do. So when I think about one of the questions asked of us by all of the Fearless Conference organizers, what can you or your organization do to transform the research enterprise and positively change the health and lives of those living with the impacts of health inequities? I also want to plant the seed and encourage everyone to be brave enough to include positionality statements in your work about your own and your team's disability status. This will help to make the less, the less apparent more apparent and give confidence to students who might not realize that this could be a career path for them. This is far more common in qualitative research, but if we really want to move the needle on representation and transform the research enterprise, we must boldly claim our identities, loud and proud as they say in the disability community. This signals so much to future generations, to the consumers of your work, to the populations in your studies too. It humanizes the work. Human lives cannot be explained by taking into account single categories such as gender, race, socioeconomic status. People's lives are multidimensional and complex. Lived realities are shaped by different factors and social dynamics that operate together. When analyzing social problems, the importance of any category or structure cannot be predetermined. It's the categories and their importance that must be discovered in the process of investigation. That's what we do so well as researchers. Relationships and power dynamics between social locations and processes such as racism, classism, heterosexism, ableism, ageism are linked. They can also change over time and be different depending on different geographic settings. People can experience privilege and, oppress and oppression simultaneously. This depends on what situation or specific context that they're in. Multi-level analyses that link individual experiences to broader structures and systems are crucial for revealing how power relations are shaped and experienced. Scholars, researchers, policymakers, and activists must consider their own social position, role, and power when taking on an intersectional approach. This reflexivity and personal awareness should be in place before setting priorities and directions in your own research and policy work and activism. Intersectionality is explicitly oriented towards transformation, building coalitions among different groups and working towards social justice. People with disabilities confront multiple barriers to inclusion and participation in the community. These barriers can be societal, attitudinal, physical, or systemic. These are often compounded for people with disabilities who are from one or more additional underserved communities such as being Black, Latino, Indigenous, Native Americans persons, or members of the LGBTQ community, or live in rural populations. The societal or attitudinal barriers are rooted in systemic ableism and racism. An intersectional framework recognizes that people from multiple underserved communities face a myriad of forms of discrimination and marginalization within systems. Systems are a critical component of intersectional work. These inequities cause systemic disadvantages, which can lead to inequitable experiences and outcomes. Another quote that I also really like 
it says, real transformation requires real honesty. And this quote comes from Bryant McGill. Systemic or institutional racism refers to complex interactions of societal systems, practices, policies, ideologies, and programs that continue inequities for underserved racial groups. Research that focuses on equity must account for and critically assess systemic structural inequities, including the roles of ableism and racism. We cannot be afraid to name these systemic barriers what they are. So what are the systemic barriers faced by activist scholar researchers? As a researcher, I began to see many of these same attitudinal barriers in the systems of research that likely prevent or prohibit or make more challenging to have disabled participants in our studies or to support disabled students as junior researchers. From everything from the derogatory and sometimes insulting language adopted by many institutional review board forms to include disability as not being important enough to include as key demographic variables or the being pushed or pressured into a non-binary question about disability. For me, there were numerous other examples, like when my graduate student who happened to be blind could not submit her, her institutional review board documentation because the submit button was not coded properly to be screen reader compatible. Intersectionality is this theoretical lens for exploring the interconnectedness of different statuses in relation to embedded systems of power, privilege, and oppression. This comes straight from Kimberly Crenshaw. And intersectionality research acknowledges complexities in the social construction of identities and lived experiences as situated in interlocking systems of inequity. Intersectionality is more than a sum of multiple identities. The intersectional framework must shape a study's research question, study design, the plan for collection and analysis of data. Balleg and Bauer wrote a very important piece differentiating between intersectional study design and intersectional analyses and how to do this in quantitative work. New knowledge generated through such research must serve as the foundation for evidence-based policies, practices, interventions, or systems change initiatives that optimize outcomes. Research must include all of us. The disability and chronic illness community is so diverse, so rich, and so beautiful. Oftentimes research takes place specific only to one type of disability. While sometimes this can be helpful for the depth of a specific issue or for something that uniquely affects that specific subpopulation, we must also consider the broader dis disabled community. In the work that I do at Neidler, I want to include individuals with both apparent and non-apparent disabilities across as many disability groups as possible. Physical, psychological, intellectual, sensory, learning, behavioral, health, chronic illness, including COVID-19 long, COVID long haulers. We also need to be intentional about including people with varied backgrounds and experiences from underserved and underrepresented communities. The diversity of the disability community is an asset and our work must be inclusive of all people with disabilities as participants. As research participants, it is far easier to design studies with diverse populations and the needs of participants with disabilities in mind up front. Throughout my career, we became intentional, for example, about the anchors that we used for scales and developed age-appropriate visual aids to help to make those anchors make more sense for an individual with intellectual disability, for example. We modified interview protocols to allow for individuals using alternative or augmentative communication devices to be able to contribute and worked with software en engineers and developers to improve the accessibility of commonly used online survey tools. Our research was more valuable as a result and it signaled inclusiveness from the start as opposed to inadvertently systemically excluding individuals who are blind from our research studies. It is a combination of both ensuring our processes are inclusive and that our protocols allow for accommodations, the same way that accommodations exist in the real world in school or the workplace. It is hard and it is messy, but it's also the right thing to do for the 61 million Americans with disabilities in our country. For example, a requirement in Neidler's funding opportunity announcements um, requires grantees to describe how they would, will obtain and incorporate input of individuals with disabilities and other key stakeholders to shape the proposed research activities. And this is also an evaluation criteria that gets scored. 
We have things in the work to help other agencies incorporate language like this and are exploring ways to bolster this across other grant mechanisms. Part of it is to give us a metric of how we, were, we are doing. And while we do collect information on disability status across our programs, we do know that it is severely underrepresented in terms of investigators with disabilities and perhaps not being disclosed. We are actively studying other federal minority fellowship programs and hoping to leverage disability researchers in these existing spaces to explore the bolstering of our own programs to, short, to target this shortage. It's imperative to the disabilities community's mantra of nothing about us without us. Some have now modified this uh, to nothing without us, period, full stop. I do not want the involvement of people with disabilities to just be a checkbox or to be an afterthought. Too often, people with disabilities are the afterthought. While this is an exceedingly complex issue to tackle, it is also so important that we are gathered here today in spaces like this to have these conversations and to share research and findings with one another about, our, about things that we've tried, things we've had successes and pitfalls. We are all a part of the solution and we need disabled and non-disabled individuals to commit to the future of the field of research. We need folks inside academia, inside the government and outside in our communities to make this a symbiotic relationship. When I think about all of this, I personally am committed to being the representation that I have always wanted and to help others be that representation for others so that we can build our disability research community and our broader research community to be as rich and diverse as we know the society is. We cannot ignore how the experience of disability is shaped by these dimensions of race, gender, class, gender expression, sexual orientation, poverty and power imbalances. A huge mission of this particular administration and what I see as my work as Nidler director is to continue to move this forward. Equity, the quality of being fair and just versus equality, the state of being equal, especially in status, rights and opportunities. Equity means meeting communities where they are and allocating resources and opportunities as needed to make up for historical, systemic oppression and ableism. We aren't all equal. Some of us need a little bit more supports than others. And in this equity space, as it relates to disability, we have long ignored certain subpopulations of black and brown disabled communities, for example, and knowing that the systemic barriers faced are numerous and complex. I wanna make sure that we are continuing to expand what we mean by equity across our research portfolio and research processes. We are working to make sure that one disabled group, for example, is not privileged over another in the research. We need to make sure that we are, that we are not ignoring other disability groups in, in the work that we are funding um, related to research. I would be remiss to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in research without also addressing it within grant making. Grant making is a key component of the research enterprise and it comes with its own nuances and systemic barriers. Equity in grants refers to the implementation and promotion of fair unbiased practices within processes, operations and systems relating to grant making. So this includes the consideration of barriers and limitations that exist for traditionally underserved older adult and disability communities in accessing resources. Grant making includes everything from the funding opportunity announcements to the process of submitting applications to the review process to making awards and implementing the grant, reporting progress and completing the closeout requirements. Equity in grant making ultimately improves access for underserved communities to benefit from funding. One example of this within Nidler is to continue to require that applicants describe the racial and ethnic diversity of their target population of people with disabilities. So this requirement requires this, this level of detail in terms of the populations that are going to be a part of the sample study. It takes all of us to embrace this fundamental shift and to question why things are done and or why they have always been done that way and to be bold to try something new. Disability and the, and the intersectional systemic barriers impacting disability must no longer be an afterthought. We need all of us across the disability networks, across the broader research enterprise to make this happen, to make this a reality. We must support one another and to help to amplify one another's messages. 
So what does it mean to achieve research equity and inclusion? For me, multiply diverse people with disabilities, it means that they are not the afterthought, that they can participate in research studies without being perceived as a burden and inconvenience, and that they see themselves represented in the questions being asked and in the identities of the people conducting the research. To me, achieving research equity and inclusion means diversifying our own project teams, our co-investigators, our study participants, and expecting this equity in our own work and in the work of others. It should not be a novelty that our study samples are representative of the diversity of our country or of the world. We must hold ourselves accountable and each other accountable and support one another on this journey. What will you do to advance research equity and inclusion in your own work?